Thank you. Thank you very much, Caro, and thank you to everybody else. And uh, I'd memorized all the names so I could thank everybody, but uh, the two of you covered it all, so I'll, I'll just go right into the, the tour. Um, thank you all for coming, though. Uh, so I'll start with uh, Tableau Vivant. So Tableau Vivant uh, translate to, translates to living picture. And uh, it's a practice that, that I'm sure people have been doing for thousands of years, but kind of uh, became more formalized and popularized uh, right around the birth of photography. So kind of middle of the 19th century, 1830s, 1840s. Um, and it was a theatrical event that people would kind of do in their living room, uh, which then transferred over into being performed in theaters. Uh, and it would be the restaging of historical events or uh, famous paintings uh, by lay people, not professionals usually, uh, standing still, um, sometimes in costume, sometimes not, and reenacting a uh, famous scene for a period of time. Um, when I first started, when I, the first time I heard of Tableau Vivant, I guess, was in my master's at Concordia, um, and I didn't know what I was doing, and a professor said, so I was interested in, in having a video and taking away from the video the things that made a video video, so taking away movement, uh, I was kind of playing with trick photography, and then I thought, well, what if I take things away from it? Uh, so taking away sound, taking away movement, taking away uh, plot, action, and what are you left with? And so I, I thought I was making videos that were, didn't have all those things in it, and one of my professors said, you're making Tableau Vivant. So, uh, so that got me, then, then I started to look deeper into the history of Tableau Vivant, and it kind of uh, dovetailed with my interests in, in photography. Um, so I'll, I'll talk, and I started, so I started making these videos around maybe 2001, 2002, um, and just kind of approaching, approaching these videos from different angles and looking at it through um, different genres of photography. So um, snapshot photography, family albums, uh, staged photography, uh, and then also became interested in how people uh, perform in museums. Um, uh, which is not to make you all self-conscious or make myself more self-conscious, but there's, uh, there's behaviors that we all kind of learn is okay or is not okay in a museum. Um, and that was uh, kind of a subject that I explored in my earliest museum stills. And when, when I say stills, it's a bit confusing because I'm not talking about photography. I'm talking about these videos of people standing still. Uh, so in this room, um, you have works that focus on... Um, people in museums and as a way to kind of reflect the museum space, uh, including mirrors in, in those spaces. Uh, so I, I, um, I shot in a museum in Montreal, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, and then I shot at the National Gallery in Ottawa. Um, and then I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to shoot at the Prado in Madrid? So I sent them an email and they said, yes, you can shoot in our museum um, you know, on, on this one day. Um, so, uh, so this is one of the videos I produced that day in the museum. Uh, and it's called, I think this one is called Two Mirrors, is that correct? Yeah. And um, I, I want, this, this painting, of course, is uh, Las Meninas, which you can see in full over here. Um, and Las Meninas is a 500-year-old painting, but it's very... Uh, kind of self-reflective and postmodern, and, and I liked that kind of uh, the self-conscious act of art making that you see in the painting, and I wanted to kind of uh, mirror that. So, so here you see us shooting this video, um, and this actually was just a, a test shot, but it ended up being a photograph that I've exhibited, because w we actually weren't posing in front of it, but you really see that kind of the mirror here becomes like the surface of the painting, and so you have... Um, you have the production of art in front, and then we're in front of, in front of this work producing a video. And this is the video that we were shooting. And I've been interested in using mirrors as a way of kind of uh, breaking down the surface of a painting, uh, and also by, by clipping off the outside, the frame, you, there's a bit of kind of confusion between what's, um, what's happening outside the picture and what's happening inside the picture. And the videos um, just, uh, kind of technical detail, the videos are um, all produced kind of the same way, which is the scene in front of it is sometimes very set up and sometimes just very quick, 
I mean, this is not a big setup. It's just two people holding a mirror. Some of the other ones you'll see, it's a much uh, more in-depth setup. But the production is always the same. The, the setup may change, but the, the production, the camera's on a tripod. And I press record and record for about five, six, seven, eight minutes, and then stop recording. And then I trim off the beginning and the end, and the videos are then uh, played real time. And then have about a, you'll see the screens will sometimes go black. So there's like a one or two seconds of black, and then it starts again. Um, they can't loop because people are in a different position at the beginning and the end. But also, I find if you, if you loop a video, it's no longer kind of about time in the same way. Uh, whereas each of these videos you see in this exhibition is a certain period of time long, and that's like a real-time section of uh, recorded present at some past moment. Um, over here, uh, these were shot in uh, the Musée de, uh, what's it called? Musée de Beaux-Arts de Quebec. Uh, no, Musée National des Beaux-Arts de Quebec in Quebec City. Um, and they invited me in to, uh, to work with their collection and to produce a project on location. Uh, and the models here, so most of my models in, in my project, uh, there's, there's a room at the other end where there's a video, and it, that's actors. But everything else is mostly uh, friends, friends of friends, and people that work in museums. Um, and when I do a project in a museum, I invite, I get the staff at the museum to send out an invitation, a kind of broad invitation to invite people to participate. So uh, this guy worked in the wood shop, and the guy in the middle in the red shirt was a curator. Um, so there's all uh, people from all the different parts of the museum will often take part in the work. Uh, it's hard to see in here. You're going to have to come back to see it because it's uh, hard to see. So over here, um, is a project called Mirroring the Brodsky. Uh, and this is a two-screen project, and it was shot in a small, um, a small museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. And uh, they had invited me to produce a project. And in going into this museum, it was an apartment museum, so it was the, the house that, um, that he had, the house and studio of the poet and painter Brodsky. And so he had his collection all over. So it was kind of a Cabinet of Curiosities kind of uh, gallery. And um, the guards would sit in these chairs in these little, little Russian museum rooms. Um, and so I, I got some uh, mirrors custom cut in different uh, shapes and sizes and had the guards hold the mirrors reflecting the other parts of the museum. And uh, you can't see it from this work, but when the work was installed, it was installed in the museum. And in, in, at the, like in Quebec City here, um, you wouldn't see the staff every day. But there, there were like eight guards in the museum, and they all took part in the, in the project. So when you then went to visit the exhibition, you would for sure see the guards that were in the, in the video. And, and my uh, part of using friends and friends of friends and amateurs is to kind of human body trying to stay still. And you can see the, both the success of that and the failure of that and our, the way our kind of uh, interior bodily workings um, happen regardless and that we don't have control over them. Uh, so I don't want yoga masters or uh, people that would actually be extremely good at standing still. Uh, so maybe we'll move uh, out of this room and uh, Oh, I'll talk for a second about the, uh, the video. As you, as you come in, um, you see a video from a project called Daydreams of the Drunken Scholar from uh, San Antonio, Texas. And this was uh, another, this project was shot inside the museum there using their artifacts. So kind of, um, a kind of imagined scene based on, because they had these rooms, like kind of didactic rooms of, of a scholar's room and an opium den in the museum. And so this was kind of a, a mashup of those two rooms and using, um, using artifacts from the museum and kind of reanimating them. Uh, and um, the models were a group of uh, local, local artists from San Antonio. So, and uh, if anybody has questions as we go, I'd be happy to uh, answer them because that will help me to uh, answer questions you might have. So let's turn to the right into the galleries. Uh, mirrors to me, actually my current uh, camera is mirrorless, so it's a change in the technology. But uh, 
mirrors, I guess, I first started thinking about them in terms of uh, cameras. And you have uh, a kind of traditional SLR camera has a mirror. And so when you look through your camera, you're seeing a reflection through a mirror. And then when the, uh, when the shutter, when the, the mirror flips up, and when, when you're actually capturing the picture, you can't, see the, you can't see through the camera. And so that kind of the moment of capture is the moment that you can't see in the mirror. Um, and I've also, the mirror is, is a useful uh, way to, th there's always, I'm sure everybody's done this, but uh, you know that moment when you're like brushing your teeth and then you catch yourself in the mirror and then you kind of stay still and you see yourself in the mirror completely still? And that kind of like, like uh, glimpsing of yourself from, from a kind of outside position. So, so I think a mirror kind of allows us to do that and also allows in a way the, the people in like in the Las Meninas uh, video allows the people in the video to kind of come out and share the space of you as the viewer um, and also the opposite, vice versa. I also, I like um, when you're kind of stuck in front of a work of art uh, and so I think that by using mirrors and by having you stand in front of someone that's standing still, there's, there's sort of, in some ways, there's a vacuum in that there's not so much going on in the video. And so eventually, you're going to end up thinking about yourself standing there in front of the video. And I like that kind of uh, reflexive loop. Hello. Uh, so this is more recent work here. Um, Moybridge is, an, when I did my uh, PhD at Concordia, I, I did a lot of uh, research on, on Moybridge and Marais and was really interested in uh, these two, two kind of uh, photographers slash scientists and their kind of different approaches and then how artists have, have used their work. Um, uh, Moybridge, I think, is, is much better known and also Moybridge is, has always been more, um, I think, influential and used by artists. And I, I've, uh, personally, I attribute that to the kind of like pseudo-scientific approach whereas Marais' works are beautiful, but they kind of look already like artwork. Um, and so in, in this series, I, I wanted to redo, I suppose I have a history, you'll see in some other projects here, of, of uh, remaking things in the most complicated way possible, which, which uh, um, the, the one thing it achieves is, is when you do something in a really complicated way and kind of with too many steps, you're able to kind of get in there a little more and see, see the construction of the image, which is interesting to me. So in, in these, um, I had people dressed in kind of a ninja outfits, so dressed in black, holding the people in, in their positions and then going through the positions. So whereas Moybridge did high-speed photography um, with a kind of a different contraption, some were like a gun that would do high-speed photography, some was like a, a fast-spinning wheel or triggers, uh, these are done by, on the exact same set. So this was a pose. We got the pose correctly and then moved on to the next pose. And you can see the, uh, so when they're off the ground, the ninjas are, are holding them in, in those positions. And so I wanted to kind of uh, draw attention to, Moybridge staged a lot of his works as well. So while they look kind of scientific on the surface, they're actually not scientific and not uh, scientifically useful whereas uh, Marais' work it was more kind of rigorous and scientific, but less useful to artists, I think, as, uh, as a result of that. Uh, let's see now. Um, uh, this is a project called uh, Unwrapping Rodin. And uh, there's a, uh, a woman in Montreal called Phyllis Lambert, who's an uh, art collector and philanthropist and runs the um, Canadian Museum, or the uh, CCA, the Canadian Centre for Architecture. And uh, she owned this Rodin and, uh, and saw some of my work and, and sent me a series of uh, photographs that she had taken of unwrapping the sculpture. So she had moved the sculpture from Chicago to Toronto. And uh, here, I'll move a little bit. Um, and when she'd, when she'd moved, um, she, she had, the, the work was wrapped kind of like this, because I think it was done maybe, let's say, in the 60s or 70s, which was before the kind of, uh, uh, I don't know what we would call it, like uh, hyper-vigilance of uh, 
conservation and art packaging and art shipping. And so it looked to me like it was maybe packed by the movers. So it was wrapped in, in foam or paper and then taped and ended up looking like a, like a mummy. Um, and when it was dropped off at her house, she had then unwrapped it and taken pictures as she went. And so you had this kind of uh, transformation like a chrysalis, like a butterfly coming out. Um, and so I asked her if I could restage her series of photographs. Um, I was also interested in this photographer of sculpture, because photography of sculpture is always uh, tricky and you're trying to kind of represent a 3D object. And then in art history uh, books, you also have an attempt to kind of take flat photographs of 3D objects, because the, they obviously don't want to kind of over-romanticize it. So you have a kind of these dull uh, pictures from certain angles in art history books, and I wanted to, uh, to kind of accentuate that. So, so the camera was just on a tripod, and they're all taken from the same angle, and I just slowly peeled apart. I hi hired a conservator to wrap it, and then we slowly peeled it off and took, took pictures as we went. And so it also ended up being, a, it, it, for this project it wasn't intentional, but if you see the full series, it's very much a Moybridge sequence as, as the sculpture moves out of the chrysalis. Sorry to be a prima donna, but if somebody could bring me a glass of water, that would be amazing. Um, uh, this is a project called Blackwater Ophelia, and it was produced in Sarnia, Ontario, and uh, the museum in Sarnia was closed for about a year as they built a new building, and so they asked me to do some uh, projects there with the, with the community. There's, uh, there's a project I'll show afterwards, so I'll talk more about my kind of community-based practice as we look at the other project. Um, but for this project, uh, we, did, we did one project in Sarnia that was, uh, used a lot of volunteers and a lot of people from the community, and then we also did this one, which just had this uh, one model. And uh, Sarnia is where, uh, oh, wow, thank you very much. You're Sorry. So I didn't know it until I went to Sarnia, but the kind of, uh, I always thought it was a California image, but this image of like a gusher, like uh, oil shooting up into the sky, is, is Sarnia was like where the first gusher was. Um, and uh, it's been kind of the, the hub of Canada's petrochemical industry for years. Um, and they've had uh, all kinds of uh, health issues because of it. Uh, and so that's where the, the idea to do a Blackwater Ophelia came from. Um, and so this is, uh, this was, uh, it's, it, there's a box, a wooden box that's three feet by three feet and seven feet long, and it opens up. And so in the back here, this is all papier-mâché and plastic flowers, and she's lying in, in a pool of water in this box. In, uh, I think on the other side of this, there's uh, some uh, catalogs and magazine stuff, so you can see some pictures of the, of the box. Um, yeah, and so here you have the, a video of that, and then here is the empty, a photograph of the empty box. And in, in most of my projects, I, I make photos and videos as I'm going, um, and then don't decide till I'm done what will kind of constitute the project. So sometimes a project will be just videos, sometimes just photographs, sometimes a mix of the two. But I don't usually make that determination till I'm kind of after, have it all, and then go back and look at it and see what, see what makes sense. And also, um, sometimes you might have a photograph that is, uh, could be a beautiful photograph, but doesn't make sense in that, in that project. Uh, over here are just some uh, sort of experiments, I would say. So these three works were kind of, I guess, based on kind of looking at, kind of, I guess, advertising images and kind of, uh, or imagery and kind of that, that mode and, and kind of studio. I had a studio for the, uh, as Chara was saying in the introduction, I produced a lot of work around the world, but often uh, I didn't have a studio for years and years and years. Uh, and then a few years ago I had a studio, and so these are very much kind of, uh, the works on this wall and the uh, Moybridge works were produced in that studio, so I feel like they were kind of like tests of studio photography projects. And this one was, I've done a couple projects with nudes, but it always, it always feels awkward to me, but this one is no less, no less the case. But it's a, it's a dur, it's like a, a kind of a 
I took a Dur print and it's kind of a, a takeoff from on the Dur print. Uh, let's see, where is this? Yes? Um, this is all digital photography or do you do dark room work? Or uh, it it's all digital photography, <laughs> but it's not, um, I, uh, there's an artist in Nelson uh, named Ruby Truly, uh, who I took a video course with once. And the, the uh, actually it was one of those CAG grants, the, uh, where you, so I got a grant to learn with a, a senior artist, and so I, I learned video with her. And the one thing she taught me, or not the one thing, but the thing that stuck with me, was uh, about polishing turds. So she said, uh, she said it's really important to like, to, to do the work to get the photo right and with sound and with video rather than afterwards trying to fix things in Photoshop or, uh, or make it better. So, uh, so while these are all taken with a digital camera, some of the ones on the other side uh, at the Prado were with a medium format camera, but now digital cameras are, are so, so good. So they're, they're shot with digital cameras, um, but uh, very little Photoshop. Just uh, adjust the colors and, and print, basically. Yeah, like I said, if there's any questions as we go, I'm happy to, uh, to answer as we, as we go. So in, uh, in 2008, 2009, I was approached by, can people, I guess people can hear me, right? Even though they're not, okay. So in 2008, uh, an old friend of mine approached me from, uh, here, I don't need to be in this room to talk about it. An old friend from a 100 mile house got in touch with me named Gus Horn and said uh, he wanted to do a Raft of the Medusa in 100 mile house. Uh, Jericho's famous painting, Raft of the Medusa. And uh, I had no idea what he meant. It was a mutual friend of ours that put us in touch and he actually didn't know the work I was doing. Um, and so I said, okay, what do you mean? And he said, well, he sort of saw, saw it as a metaphor for the way the government had treated like the, um, the forestry industry and the cattle industry. Um, and I, I kind of looked at the project and I said, this project is going to cost too much. I don't know how we're going to possibly do it. And he said, okay, well, if you can bring the cameras, um, if you can bring the cameras and, and kind of uh, produce it, I can uh, find you people to model and, um, and we can, we can get, there was a local woman who was a uh, pharmaceuticals rep and she had points to fly us out from Montreal. I was living in Montreal at the time. Um, and so this project became kind of um, a roadmap for how to do these community-based projects. And so since then, I've done maybe, I don't know, I wanna say five community-based projects, maybe seven, maybe eight. Um, and so they involve Going to uh, going somewhere, meeting with people, um, explaining my process, uh, finding out the kinds of things that they're interested in, finding out the local skills in the community, um, and then working towards a project. Uh, so usually I go there once and, and meet everybody, see who's interested, show my work, show past projects, uh, and then I'll go back to produce the work, which is usually between 10 days and uh, uh, five weeks, let's say. And then uh, either something I've been doing recently is having the exhibition straight away at the end of that period, which is extremely stressful but is kind of fun as well, or else I'll go back to my studio and look things over and then have the exhibition. Uh, so for instance, the project I'm doing now in Richmond, we're building everything right now, building all the sets and the props uh, with a group of volunteers, and then we'll shoot it um, in about two weeks and the show opens in three weeks. So it's... Uh, it's crazy and it's hectic, but it's fun and it's productive. Um, so this project was kind of the, the prototype for that. And um, uh, so this was produced in 2009. And then in 2016, I was invited to uh, St. Louis in Senegal. And um, I was invited to do a residency there. And the host of the residency said, uh, you can do whatever you want here, but I just want you to know that the Medusa, the raft of the Medusa, um, the, the Medusa, the boat that the raft came from, was headed to St. Louis, Senegal in 1816, which is exactly 200 years ago. So I said, what? Okay, I gotta do this. So uh, the project at the end of the hall here, um, down this kind of narrow hall, this is a video, um, was produced in a warehouse in St. Louis over uh, five weeks. Um, St. Louis is about four hours north of Dakar, and it's the um, 
the westernmost tip of Africa, so the closest part of Africa to like Florida. Um, and so this was produced with a group of locals and we, we rebuilt the, th this project was based on, while the one from 2000, the Raft of the Medusa 100 Mile House is based on Jericho's painting. The, the Raft of the Medusa from 2016 is based on um, the actual raft. So uh, survivors of the raft um, uh, made careful drawings of what the raft looked like. And so this was a two scale, one to one model of the raft. Um, that we then, and then we shot it over a series of five days. So we had the raft um, more crowded, and then as the days went on, kind of people naturally, you know, either got bored or had other things to do. And so each day there were fewer and fewer people on the raft, just like there were on the 17 days in the, in the original raft. Um, yeah. Yes? Did you do that for 17 days? Sorry, I missed that part. Oh. Uh, this one here on the wall was done in a week in 100 Mile House. Uh, the, the one on the end here was uh, five weeks in Senegal. But, so, uh, so you continued shooting for five weeks? No, I shot for uh, three days for that project. Yeah, three or four days. Usually for, I mean, the, rap, the first draft of the Medusa, uh, like I said, it was this guy Gus Horn's uh, concept. Uh, but for a lot of these projects, I don't actually know what I'm going to do when I get there. And then the project kind of uh, comes to life and kind of become something as I'm there. So first week or, or first 20% of the time is spent figuring out what I'm going to do, and then 60% doing it, and then 20% like getting ready for the exhibition, I would say. Um, and these are, um, the works you're seeing here are parts of series. So uh, the, for instance, the one at the end from the Raft of the Medusa St. Louis, um, there's three other videos and there's photos of that. So if you want to see that, you could, uh, um, I think some of the catalogs on the other side in the kind of educational area, um, you could see more on my website, you could see more. Uh, let's move around this way. Uh, often schlocky, romantic kind of thing. And then, all, then this kind of modern slash postmodern. And it's also, you know, turn of the century. Um, but so I was thinking about his work. This is the Burgers of Calais. And I was thinking about this sculpture as being a kind of a, a constant. There's 12 casts of it in 12 different cities in the world. And so I was thinking that if you have something that is exactly the same in 12 different cities, but the cities around it are different, that by kind of uh, examining that work in that city, you could reflect the city that's around the work, if that makes sense. Um, so in Seoul, uh, so I've done this a couple times in different cities. I haven't done it 12 times. Um, and so over here, I got a group of uh, quick service couriers in Seoul who are sort of, Seoul is a city of 20 million people in South Korea, and the motorcycle couriers are kind of the grease that keeps this machine going. They're zipping around, and you never, uh, they always have masks, and they're delivering money, delivering goods, and you never um, really get to see them. And so here, by kind of getting them to pose and taking off their helmets, you kind of have this, this kind of moment to really kind of, uh, examine them in a way, and also I think they become uh, more heroic. And so while they become more heroic, the sculpture being treated the same way kind of uh, becomes less heroic, I hope. And in this one, you see the, the track that I was pushing, walking slowly, pushing the camera around. And that's also something I think in my work showing uh, um, both not trying to hide the production, but also kind of self-consciously showing it. So if you're showing this, the production, then you're doing it consciously, and then what do you include or not include uh, once, you're, once you're doing that. Um, as as uh, was said in the introduction, uh, Russ Bonin is here from Augusta, Georgia. And for the, uh, the Blackwater Ophelia was the first project we worked on together. And uh, whenever I can, if I have the budget, I'll bring him in. And is he here, Russ? Are you here? He's here somewhere. Um, but uh, he's helped me now on maybe five or six projects. And uh, this one, I wanted to do, uh, I've wanted to do a Guernica for a while. And um, uh, so we talked about doing it um, in different places. And I thought, because uh, it's like a kind of a war protest uh, painting, it's a, a Picasso painting, of course. Um, I, I thought that uh, the United States, um, this was done a couple of years ago, I guess two, three, two years ago, so around when Trump became president, I thought this is a good moment to produce this in the States, in kind of Trump country. And uh, so I, uh, I was mentioning this to Russ, 
and he said, oh, I have uh, Guernica at my house. And I said, oh, but I want to do this one like full scale, one to one. He said, yeah, I have that in my house. Because he had, uh, for a theater production like 20 years ago, he'd made uh, Guernica as a backdrop for like a play about Picasso. And he'd painted it on, on fabric. And underneath there was paper that you put down. And so he'd kept the paper rolled up for 15, 20 years. And uh, so when we got there, we had these templates for, for Guernica. Um, and so then uh, we cut Guernica up and had it kind of like, uh, like protest signs. So each piece of it, I think there's, there's maybe 13 people here, I think, 13 or 14 people, each holding one of the sections. Um, so this is obviously a photograph. It doesn't move. Um, and in the video, you kind of see them gently swaying. Uh, this, on this wall is a group I did in, uh, in Russia, and the, it's called the Russians, and I, I named it after, um, oh no, I'm going to forget his name, uh, the Americans, uh, Robert Frank. Uh, so Robert Frank's The Americans is a, is a documentary series of photographs, and uh, doing this in, I guess, 20, 2011. Um, it was kind of, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, I guess my wife studied communication studies and so I guess through her I learned about, uh, you know, kind of documentary and post-documentary and things like that. And so um, when Robert Frank was, uh, who's a Swiss artist, um, traveling around the States taking pictures, I think you still had that kind of, uh, you know, Walker Evans, Dorothea Lange, this idea that you could be a fly on the wall and the idea of like an uh, objective view, um, which in 2011 is already long gone. Um, and so, so it was kind of a mix between uh, cap There was very little uh, setup in these, but I wasn't shy to, to move people around or to uh, change things or make this bed or move something up here. So kind of painting, painting in the image, um, but, while, but also, uh, this woman was just sitting in her home, and these people were out. These people were out getting ice cream, actually dressed like this. I didn't redress any of these people. They were, <laughs> and it was some kind of strange Russian ice cream that didn't really melt. It just kind of stayed as is. Um, but this series, actually, I, the one thing I like about this series is that they're quite a bit looser. Like in here, you see a lot more movement than in some of my other works, and that's because I don't speak Russian. And so while in in the other works. I might tell people, you're doing a good job, keep breathing, and I kind of talk them through the process. Um, the works I did in Russia, I wasn't able to because I, I didn't have the communication skills. And so they're a lot kind of uh, looser in a way. Um, and these, these works we produced just kind of wandering around uh, uh, kind of the countryside of Russia. So we had two bikes, two cameras, two tripods, and we would find someone and uh, I had some kind of pamphlets, and I would say, I'm an artist from Canada, and can I shoot you? Can you stand still? And, and, uh, and then they would uh, often kind of take me to the next person, or somebody would come by and say, what are you doing? And so we would get kind of passed around or kind of floated around, and that's how we... So it was kind of the closest I've gotten to a documentary project, but very uh, not, not trying to, uh, to be true documentary. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what's in this room. And then uh, we won't go in that room because it's small, but you can, can go in that room. Um, I've done two collaborations now with uh, the uh, Quebecois filmmaker Denis Arcan. And in here, uh, you can see that. And so it's a video about a group of people who are hired by some kind of uh, un unknown philanthropist to pose as the Burgers of Calais in Vancouver. And so you see people who've been hired to do a performance um, kind of talk about their, but it's really, uh, it's really kind of a portrait of these six, six people. Um, so I, won't, I don't want to say too much more about that, but you, in a way it, it, talks about, uh, it talks about art, it talks about commerce, it talks about uh, work, um, and uh, the video is about uh, 15 minutes long. Uh, and it's shot on, we shot vertically. So we turn the camera on its side. And so you, you have these, each, each uh, sliver kind of tells the story of one of the people as every day they're hired to perform the Burgers of Calais in downtown Vancouver. Uh, 
So I won't. Uh, how am I doing for time? I could do this all night. Time. Okay. Uh, maybe I could take some questions now. Yeah. Yep. Are, are these images here based on pictures or artwork, or did you just create these? Right. So the question is, uh, are these ones based on something, or did I just create them? Uh, these are not based on on anything. They're um, they're kind of inspired by Robert Frank's photography, but it, they're not. They don't look like Robert Frank's photos at all. Feels like, feels like that is, I've seen that somewhere before. Kind of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, I think we all have kind of these image banks that we reference. So I think often uh, you can do something subconsciously, make a recreation, but also you kind of clump uh, images together. Um, but uh, there, were, there were also, there's a photographer named uh, Sergei Prokudin Gorsky, uh, which was actually my reason for traveling to Russia to make these works. These works don't actually look like his works at all, but he was using um, three different uh, filters, a red, a green, and a blue filter to make full color photographs at the turn of the century. And if you look them up online, you can see they have all his works in high resolution at the uh, Library of Congress in the States. And they're, they're absolutely amazing. Um, so I went to Russia intending to do that. And I did some tests with that process. Uh, and they failed miserably. And I ended up, so these were intended initially to be divided into the three colors and laid on top of each other. But I, when I got home and, and did that to these videos, they didn't work. So that's, yeah. But they weren't remakes of his uh, photos. They were more reworks, remakes of his process because he had a rail car provided by the Tsar and he just traveled around Russia making photographs uh, for a period of years until the Tsar fell and then he fled to Paris. And uh, yeah, but the glass slides are with the Library of Congress and you can see them online and they're amazing. It's like uh, uh, photos of Tolstoy and uh, yeah, they're amazing. Any other questions? Thank you all for standing and squishing into small spaces. Thank you, Dad, for that. And uh, now the opening officially begins. The bar is open. There's food. There's music. So please enjoy yourselves. Thanks, Dad. Thank you.